Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Malia Sanford, for those of you who I don't know, um, and I am the programs manager at the Lopez Island Library. And I'm pleased to see and welcome you all and thank you for coming to this evening's program featuring local author and photographer, Peter Cavanaugh, who is here to speak about his newest book, 100 Flying Birds, Photographing the Mechanics of Flight. And I have the book right here. This is the library copy. And I have really enjoyed looking through this book, Peter, the, the stories that you tell um, and your photographs, of course are amazing and really fun to read. For, okay. each, <laughs> for each picture in the book, Peter shares the challenges of the shoot, the beauty of the location, and the curiosities of the species that he photographs. Bird people will enjoy the bird photographs and facts. Travelers will gobble up the tales of distant lands and photographers will absorb the technical details. And I also wanted to mention here that um, in conjunction with this author talk, Peter has hung some of his prints, um, his photographs on the walls of the library from this book. Um, and so for all of you who are on Lopez, I really uh, encourage you to come check those out because they are stunning. Um, and they will be up through February 3rd. So you have some time. They just, they just went up last week. It's so fun to be working amongst these photographs. This program is the final episode in our fall series of local author talks. Um, and it has been just a pleasure on behalf of the Lopez Library to facilitate these connections between our local talent and their audience and fans from both near and far. We will continue to feature local authors at the library, either virtually or hopefully in person for as long as the locals keep writing. So stay tuned for the spring lineup, uh, which will be announced in early 2022. Okay, and now I am pleased to introduce Peter Cavanaugh. Peter has been taking photographs since he was five years old, growing up in England. He was inspired and instructed by his mother who left school when she was 15 years old and worked as a photographer's darkroom assistant. His own camera collection includes examples from the era of mahogany glass plate cameras but he feels more at home behind the long lens of a micro four thirds Olympus M1X. Peter's images have been included three times in the Audubon Society's top 100 bird photographs of the year. Peter is a member of the North American Nature Photographers Association and he guest curated the exhibit, How Birds Fly at the Seattle Museum of Flight. Among his recent shows was a six month exhibit, Birds of the Pacific Northwest at the Seattle Aquarium. So after Peter's presentation this evening, we will open up the virtual floor to audience Q&A. So feel free to either use the hand raising option in Zoom or uh, write your questions in the chat and we will get to them at the end. And now please, Join me um, in welcoming virtually Peter Cavanaugh. Yay! Thank you, Malia. <laughs> well, it's my great pleasure to be with you tonight. And um, I see a lot of friends uh, who have joined. And um, in normal times, we'd be sitting around the fire. Uh, who knows, somebody might have bought a bottle of wine if uh, that's in Malia's regulations, maybe not. But it's not normal time, so, uh, so here we are, and uh, I'm going to do a, uh, a virtual talk. And um, you've seen the copy of the book. Uh, inside the book is um, uh, a, a, a gray heron. And another picture of this gray heron is actually hanging on the library here, on the library wall. 
and uh, you could come and take a look at it. I want to tell you what I want to do today. I, I want to tell you a little bit about my background, um, how I came to be here taking photographs, what my photographic journey has been. Um, then a bit about the evolution of the book. Um, I'm going to uh, read a couple of stories from the book and tell you uh, about future directions, because obviously uh, everyone's always thinking about what's next. You know, Prometheus, they said about Prometheus, sure, he invented fire, but what has he done lately? So uh, I will try and uh, answer that one. And then we'll take your questions. And so um, that's what I plan to do. Um, as Malia said, I grew up in England, and um, these are some of the cameras that I have used um, during my period of taking photographs. Believe it or not, there was still a Kodak Brownie number one box camera in my house. Uh, this camera actually was bought out in uh, 1901, and my mother still had one, and I remember putting a roll of film in it and uh, opening it at the wrong time and losing all the exposures. And I, I owned a Brownie um, uh, 127 camera uh, when I was um, five or six years old. I owned a later Brownie box camera. And we did have a dark room in our house where we would coax images from those pungent black and white uh, chemicals of uh, Hypo and, uh, and Developer and so on. The first uh, a serious camera I had was this Olympus over here. And um, when I went to college, I, I thought I was going to be an athlete, not a, a, a photographer or a scientist. And I'm the skinny one in the back row there. I, I had this beautiful Rolex Baby Gray, which I actually still own. It's not a great bird photographer's camera, but I sure loved the quality of the engineering and just the joy of using this thing. Uh, I did my graduate work at the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine in, in the United Kingdom. I, I hasten to say those are not the dates that I attended the school. Uh, they are the dates that it was established and closed down. But this started a theme for me where I use photography in a professional context. And I have done that all my life. Um, I studied here the mechanics of locomotion, particularly human walking. And when I finally got my first real job at Penn State University, where I came immediately after graduate school, I, I joined a team at the biomechanics lab at Penn State University. And um, there actually is a plaque there talking about this. And that makes me feel like I, I, I perhaps should not be here because usually there's a plaque after you, you know, you've passed on uh, several years, but anyway, um, we studied motion capture there. And this, I think many of you are aware, is the basis for film animation today, where you take successive frames of video or, tele or uh, film, and then you capture joint markers and animate them, and then you morph them into a, uh, a cartoon character. An important thing also happened while I was at Penn State, and that is I learned to fly. And that was particularly important for my present passion of shooting birds in flight. When you study to be a private pilot, particularly when you uh, study to get an instrument rating, you learn a lot about aerodynamics. You have to stop your plane falling out of the sky. And so this was a particularly fascinating period for me. And uh, I really enjoyed studying the whole aerodynamics of the wing and of the plane. And this has carried over into my love of aerodynamics of bird flight. When I came to the University of Washington, you notice that it's raining, it's spring and it's raining, of course. Um, I got a, a Canon 50D camera and a decent lens, a Canon 100-400 um, lens, a zoom lens. And uh, I, I remember and know the very day on which my passion for bird flight photography started. And uh, on February the 8th, 2009, I went to Fur Island with Paul Bannon. I think many of you know Paul. He's written the beautiful book, The Owl and the Woodpecker and other books. And we went to Fur Island, that remarkable little sector of land that 
uh, lies between the two forks of the Skagit River. And this is the first bird photograph of a flying bird that I really took. It's not one I'd be particularly proud of today, but it represents the very first uh, genesis of my interest in flying birds. And I remember Paul saying to me that day, uh, don't think it's always going to be this good. There were uh, harrier hawks fighting the short ear owls. And uh, of course, I got no photographs of any of that because I, I was just bewildered by what was happening. And true to what he said, uh, it doesn't happen very often that you see such remarkable aerial um, combat. So very soon after that, I got myself a, a decent rig. And that rig was a Canon 1DX Mark I and a, uh, a larger prime lens, uh, Canon 50 millimeter lens. Um, and I saw some person wrote today uh, on my the comment for my exhibit here at the library, he wrote uh, nice lens and autofocus camera, <laughs> which is true, of course. Um, and, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the use of that uh, nice lens and autofocus camera, because after I got this rig, my and my philosophy really was, you know, I have this camera and now I'm going to travel and find birds that I love to photograph. And, and that is how this book really grew. So uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take us all on a very quick round the world journey with a few stops at some of the places that I have been to photograph birds for this book. I'm going to miss out a lot because... Um, uh, we have limited time, but let's uh, make a start. And of course, the best place to start is at home. And these are, this is an x-ray of the claws of an osprey. And this is one of our neighbors here on Lopez. Um, we don't have too many ospreys, too many pairs of ospreys here, but this is the pair that nests uh, at the end of Bayshore Road. And Taking a picture of a bird landing is actually not so simple as it might appear to be because it presumes if you're all set up as I was with a tripod and, uh, um, uh, and a fixed focus lens already pre-focused, you've got to know where the, the bird is landing. And I was lucky enough that my friend Beth Shirk told me which tree that this osprey likes to perch on before it goes, uh, uh, goes hunting. And so I was able to get this picture of uh, the full extent of this osprey's um, under wing plumage. I also know where this bird's nest is, just about a couple of hundred yards from this spot. And I want to share with you a, um, a piece of film of two chicks that that osprey raised that summer. This was last summer. Now, this is a juvenile bird and He's bored because the parents haven't bought food for a while. And all he's doing is just hovering. And you can see little brother on the left is very bored with it, saying, oh, there he goes, showing off again. And he's got a dead fish tail uh, in his claws. And you can see that the wings are basically just sweeping horizontally. This bird is getting lift, but no thrust at all because it's staying in the same place and there's not much of a headwind. So this osprey family has been a real inspiration for me here on Lopez during the summer months. So let's start on our journey and go up to Boundary Bay, which we weren't able to do for many months until uh, a month or two ago. And some of you may remember a few years ago, there was an eruption of snowy owls uh, at Boundary Bay. There was um, perhaps 25 of these birds who couldn't find food further north. And they came down to Boundary Bay, which is a great place to photograph birds. And this is uh, one of those birds flying. Owls, of course, are fascinating uh, because they have extremely quiet flight. And they have a number of specializations uh, on the wing and on other parts of their body to make that the case. They have serrations on the leading edge, whereas a bird uh, like a gull would have a, a, a knife edge uh, leading edge, and they have a very fluffy trailing edge. And these and other modifications mean that they fly very quietly. And that's so that they, of course, 
can surprise their prey, but also it's been speculated that is so they can hear the prey and are not, uh, it's not uh, compromised by the sound of their own wing noise. Um, this is one example of a feature that's been copied by, uh, for biomimetic design of, of aircraft. Well, let's take a plane, probably have to go to Vancouver, take a plane to Iceland, and on the very western tip of Iceland, on a place called the Lotterberg Bird Cliff that you see here, I took this picture of an Atlantic puffin uh, thrusting itself off into the air at takeoff. Puffins are fascinating because their wings are a compromise between flying in air and flying in water. Uh, the alcids, of which the, the Atlantic penguin is a member, are a group of birds who actually use their wings underwater, not their feet. When you see a puffin underwater, it is actually swimming with its wings. This same bird, I traveled to Scotland to see, and this bird bringing home lunch for its, um, it, its chicks was right directly above Fingal's Cave, which you see on the left on the Isle of Lunga in Scotland. Uh, Fingal's Cave is a special place for me because um, Mendelssohn, of course, wrote the overture to the Fingal's Cave. And that was one of my mother's favorite pieces of music. And on top, right above that cave, the puffins nest on the edge of the cliff. And you can see here, they actually uh, also contest that nest space with local rabbits. So uh, photographing these puffins as they come in is, is a tricky thing to do because the best bird photographs are taken when you've had the bird in your, in your lens and focused on it as it approaches you. But these birds just pop up from the cliff. They've got a very sort of uh, non-linear approach to the cliff. And so it took me most of the day to get a picture of a bird with its... Uh, uh, with, the, with the sand lance in its, in its bill. Well, from Scotland, let's go over to Japan and in particular to the Northern Island, uh, Hokkaido, where you can find Japanese red crowned cranes. These absolutely magnificent birds that uh, do these choreographed ballets in their mating sequence. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, on the island of Hokkaido when there was an absolutely blinding snowstorm. And uh, this next picture is a, a picture of them coming in the day before the snowstorm. But here you see uh, one of the red crown cranes just dancing, jumping for joy in, in this blizzard. Uh, sometimes bad weather can really be your friend when you're taking photographs. I actually love to go out in bad weather because unexpected things can happen to you, like this picture of the red crown crane. I should mention that that kimono, that wedding kimono that you see there with red crown cranes on is because these birds are revered in Japan for their fidelity to their partner. And so um, wedding kimonos frequently feature uh, red crown cranes. South Africa is an absolutely magnificent place to photograph birds and obviously wild animals in general. And I could spend the whole of this evening's talk uh, really talking about South Africa. This is one of my favorite birds. It is a saddle-billed stork at Kruger National Park in South Africa. I've spent um, a couple of visits in Africa trying to photograph these birds in flight. Uh, on the left, I, I staked out the nest of uh, a saddlebill stork for almost a complete day. And all the bird did was stand up a couple of times and yawn. So I was delighted with this particular bird in the Kruger National Park, uh, who I got, uh, of whom I got several flight shots. They call this bird the German flag bird for obvious reasons. You can see it has, if you count its yellow wattle, it has all the colors of the German flag uh, on, its, on its body. When you're in Africa and you find a hornbill nest as a photographer, you have found a bonanza. And that's because of the uh, bizarre nesting habits of almost every species of hornbill. 
you see here a southern um, yellow-billed hornbill bringing a centipede and sticking it through a small hole in the tree. And what's happening here is in this cartoon on the left, after they have mated, the female hornbill is sealed into a nest cavity, which he and she then close with feces and mud. And she then does a simultaneous molt of all the feathers in her body. From that moment on, she is totally dependent on the male for survival. And of course, his job is to deliver food to her and eventually to her chicks every 30 or 45 minutes throughout the 45 days of her confinement. So that's why I say it's just a real bonanza to have found this. This is another kind of hornbill uh, in Kruger National Park, uh, a trumpeter hornbill. It's got this beautiful cask on top of its head. And I've got some video here, and those are hippos you'll hear in the background, of this bird coming to the nest cavity. And it's got small fruit in his bill, making sure the coast is clear. And then he sticks it into the hole. He's found another one he left behind from before, but now, like a gumball machine, he simply starts regurgitating one after the other and after the other. And I'm not gonna bore you, but I counted them. There's over 30 of these small fruits that this bird brought in uh, before uh, he'd, uh, he delivered the whole load to the female. Then he decided it was actually time to clean out the nest a little bit. So there he is, and then he flew away, only to return again. So this was a, a great stakeout um, of this bird's nest with uh, very productive uh, video and stills. One of the most dramatic, exciting, stimulating places that I have been to in the world to photograph uh, wild animals is the island of South Georgia, south of the Antarctic Convergence in the South Atlantic. The first view of it is something like this. You come on the north, uh, the, the northeastern end of it, and there are these huge mountains. It's famous, of course, for Shackleton's traverse of the mountains when he was trying to save his crew after an Antarctic disaster. It's full of penguins. And when I say full, here you see the kind of density of uh, birds that you might see. The young are uh, aligned in front, you can see here. And it's a very intricate and organized social relationship where when the, the these are king penguins, when they go off to, to fish, the young are left behind with a few caregivers. And it's really remarkable. I mean, who decides? Who's going to look after the kids today? And uh, are they dependable? And then even more, how do they find their kids? There are at least 10,000, 20,000 penguins in this place. And uh, somehow they go, come ashore and go right to their kids and, and feed them. I've got a short video I want to show you now of uh, King Penguins on South Georgia. It's uh, nothing to do with flight, but I couldn't resist showing it to you. You can see what an amazingly pristine environment it is. And the fact that the animals, they don't care at all about your presence. As long as you don't intrude on them, they 
are most uh, more than likely to come and take a look at you and, uh, and then go about their way. Now, penguin colonies are dynamic and dramatic places to photograph. And uh, you can see here, there's one bird flying over and that is a brown skua. And um, uh, here you see in the Falkland Islands at a penguin colony, a pair of very angry rock, Southern rock harper penguins. You can just see in the bottom left by this bird's left foot, it has an egg and they know exactly what the skua has in mind. And this is taken just very shortly afterwards. The skua dove in between those penguins, took the egg, and then fought off many other uh, kleptoparasitic birds who also wanted the egg before it broke the egg, smashed it, and went to eat it. The Falkland Islands are a pretty incredible place as well. Um, I know uh, Gene's on the call and, uh, tonight and he's been there and it's a really fantastic place. This is a very uh, a rare bird, a striated caracara that uh, is pulling a penguin carcass across the beach. It can't lift it, but it's, uh, it's pulling it off to a place where it can uh, eat and scavenge it all by itself. Another brief penguin video is of some this time gentoo penguins coming ashore. And actually, this music is the Hebrides Overture by Mendelssohn. This group's a bit bewildered by the photographers looking at them. They've had enough. Well, a good place to stop coming back from the South Atlantic is uh, Patagonia. And I visited a place in Patagonia, and I'm sure those of you who take photographs have also been many times to a place where you're told, you can certainly see this bird there. I was told that there are dependably California, uh, not California, Andean condors at the Estancia Olga Teresa. And uh, I waited for three days. And within uh, the last two hours of my stay, finally a squadron of Andean condors came flying in. Just an astonishing bird to see at eye level. These birds are in rapid decline. And I'll talk a little bit about decline of bird populations later but an absolute thrill to photograph a bird like this. To me, it looks like the wings look like the keyboard of some cathedral organ that somebody should sit down and play at. It's just really marvelous bird. Another very, very productive place for a photographer, a bird photographer is Peru. This is an unusual bird called a hoatzin. It's a genus of one. It has no immediate uh, uh, living relatives. Um, ornithologists and phylogeneticists don't know where to place this bird in the whole scheme of, uh, of the uh, um, recent birds. It, it scrambles up and down the, uh, the vegetation in a, a very uh, clumsy way. And the young of this bird actually have claws uh, between their uh, hand wing and the primaries. The uh, clay licks at Tambo Pata in Peru are very famous and remarkable places. Um, pairs of scarlet macaws, red and green macaws, other macaws start coming in just after dawn and they wait in the trees until they think it's safe to come down onto the clay where they get minerals that they do not have in their diet. They are extremely wary and extremely jumpy. And a few moments after this photograph was taken, this happened and they were scared by something. This is a, uh, uh, a photograph uh, from the book and um, uh, they were not back for the rest of the day. So they are extremely wary of mostly um, marauding hawks who know 
that it's a good place to come for dinner. Moving on to Ecuador, um, this bird is one of the most unusual birds in the avian kingdom. It is a sword-billed hummingbird. It uh, is a remarkable example of the co-evolution of flowers and birds. You see on the left, the, uh, the flowers of Brugmasia that this bird feeds on, and it owns this flower because there is not another bird with a bill that can go inside this flower. And here you see the bird actually feeding from the flower. One of my favorite places to go is Costa Rica. And uh, these, this is a picture from the lowlands of Costa Rica. This bird seems to me like a bird an artist designed. If you gave an artist a blank bill and said, make a beautiful bird, please, would you? You know, a little dab of orange, dab of maroon, purple, blue, green, yellow, black, just an astonishing, astonishing bird, the keel-billed toucan. They are residents of the Pacific lowlands and uh, catching them in flight is tricky because they move extremely fast. And here you see one leaving with a piece, a piece of banana from a feeder uh, at uh, the lodge there. Well, we're heading back now and uh, heading back uh, a stop at Green Island on the Gulf Coast of Texas. This is a place where it's an Audubon Island. It's a private Audubon Island and both uh, reddish egrets and uh, roseate spoonbills breed there. And I've been fortunate to go there several times. There are, uh, there are stands that stand uh, at the canopy level. So you can again, see these birds and photograph them at eye level, quite really remarkable birds, almost uh, th that were almost exter exterminated from Florida. Another great birding destination is Bosque, Bosque del Apache in, uh, in, in, in New Mexico. And uh, this is a, a good example of uh, a lesson I talk in the book about finding the backdrop for your shot. I have hundreds of shots of these sandhill cranes leaving their morning roost uh, against the sky, against the mountains. But by walking just 40 or 50 yards up the lake, uh, I was able to place this bird, and I knew they would be flying past, against a background which was um, much more aesthetically beautiful than simply photographing it against the sky. And I often say that the, uh, the, the feet of the photographers best tool in many respects, because simply moving, walking, finding what might be a good backdrop for the shot is really quite important. Big Sur in California is a place where you can see the endangered California condor. These birds, as most of you know, were brought back from the brink. There were only 24 of them in existence, both wild and in captivity at their lowest point. And it's been a remarkable story of success, which is, is still in process. They've been released now in sites in Utah. And uh, nevertheless, they are still on the verge because they consume carrion that has lead ammunition in it. And many of these birds are trapped and collected every year to detoxify them from lead. And it's still a, an open question as to whether they are going to survive. On the way back to Lopez, what better to stop, place to stop than Skagit County. And here, what I think we all have probably seen is a, uh, a video of thousands and thousands of snow geese. I love the way the flight propagates throughout this flock. It started at the back, it spread to the right at the back, it's coming forward, and all of these birds now feel the imperative to leave. And by the time I had finished taking this video, Every single bird of the, of the thousands that are in this field 
had left. And sometimes they come towards you and darken the sky as they fly across you. It's really a quite remarkable experience. And that's the picture that I chose to put in the book, taken in Skagit County, of a blizzard of snow geese uh, above, the, uh, above the trees. Well, back to Lopez Island, and uh, this is one of our neighbors. This is one of the eagles that lives on the uh, north end of the Tombolo. Um, he is taking off into a stiff headwind, and that pattern of the Venetian blind nature of the, uh, of the wings is uh, a pattern which is called wingtip reversal, which allows the bird to recover the wings for a downstroke very quickly, uh, minimizing the air resistance in the wing. So let's take a breath. We are home after a long journey. And I want now to talk to you a little bit about um, why I choose to photograph flight and to tell you how the book emerged from the journey that I have just uh, talked to you about. This is a tawny eagle in Namibia that I took recently perching. And um, it's a decent shot, but I feel that by waiting and uh, getting the right settings to get this shot, really pictures this bird uh, as it would like to be pictured. Uh, this bird is a raptor, it's a hunter. You see that intense gaze that uh, prey has been spotted and it is heading off on a mission. This is a, an endangered bird called a lapid face vulture. Again, a perching shot, not a bad shot, but a few minutes after this shot, it took to the air and you see these scimitar-like primary feathers hanging down from these enormous wings of this bird. So for me, there's no contest between a perching shot and a flight shot. The flight shot always wins, but I know that's not what everybody thinks. I know uh, on social media, uh, some of the most popular shots that I have are birds sitting in trees, but <laughs> that's not um, what really fires me up about taking photographs. Well, during these travels that I have shown you, um, I shot more than half a million images. Now that sounds like a lot of images. Well, it is a lot of images, but it uh, sounds like a lot, but I take 30 images every second when I press the shutter release on my camera. I shoot at a continuous rate of 30 frames per second, and then I can choose the posture, the sharpness, the, the setting, the background that I like the best. Now, every image has a story and every bird competes daily for survival um, with its conspecifics and others. And each image has unique camera settings. And so I wanted to showcase the images. I wanted to tell the stories and, and inform my readers a bit about flight mechanics and photographic techniques and, and conservation status. And so this is how it came together. I chose a uh, hundred birds in uh, uh, 11 different groups and a typical page from the book you see here is the species name, physical data about the bird and conservation status, including a population estimate, the location where the picture was taken, the camera settings, and then a story, three to 450 words about the bird, about the setting, about the the, the place, about the camera, uh, whatever. Uh, this is a yellow leg gull taken in the Netherlands. So that is one story in one chapter. There are nine stories. And here you see all the stories in the gulls and turn chapter. And um, here you see all the chapters, 11 chapters, cranes, condors, large water birds, small water birds, songbirds, etc., together with an epilogue which deals with conservation that I'll mention in a few minutes. So I, I wanna read you a couple of stories from the book now. And uh, this is a black skimmer. It's a bird that we do have in the US, but this actual picture was taken on the Cuiaba River in the Pantanal in Brazil. It was taken in July. And um, uh, uh, here's the story uh, that I wrote to go along with it. Arriving in a new part of the world and encountering a familiar bird, 
is like an unexpected meeting with an old friend. Granted, this subspecies is different from the birds I've seen in Texas, but there are just minor, almost indistinguishable color differences between the two. The unmistakable bill and feeding behavior of this black skimmer welcomed me back to common ground. The image was taken at the end of a particularly rich and exciting day, starting at Porto Joffre, a small community at the end of the Transpantinera Highway in Brazil's Pantanal. After photographing iconic Toco Tucans in the early morning, our day had included close range sighting of jaguars, giant otters, and the world's largest living rodents, the capybaras. As the late afternoon sun turned the Cuiaba River into a strand of liquid gold, we guided our small boat into the calm eddy at the end of the day to photograph the skimmer's feeding. The magical light seemed at first to be its own reward, but as I continued to shoot, adjusting my settings for the decreasing light, it soon became obvious that several of the birds were pushing the envelope too far and wiping out, cartwheeling, bill over tail and crashing into the water. I do not know if these were young birds just learning the trade or experienced adults who felt that the benefits of deep exploration with their bills outweighed the risks. This encounter reminded me that we observe so much flawless flight behavior in birds that it comes as a real shock when they make a mistake and something goes radically wrong. Next, I want to come uh, right home to Lopez Island. And this is a photograph I took last summer, the summer before last uh, on, uh, on Lopez. It's a cedar waxwing. The bird is only six inches long from tip to beak. It has a wingspan of just about a foot. It weighs um, 1.2 ounces. And uh, it was taken here on the island. The skeleton of a homesteader's stone fireplace guards the entrance to Fisherman Bay on Lopez Island, Washington, from behind the remnants of an old orchard. One small tree, a black mulberry, stands alone, embarrassed perhaps by its broken limbs and a peach fuzz of foliage clinging to its remaining branches. The tree's forlorn anatomy does, however, make it an ideal setting for photographing the sublime cedar waxwing. I developed a close relationship with this tree during almost 15 hours of shooting over five days. As each session progressed, I moved in a circle around the tree to keep the sun at my back. Cedar wings, uh, waxwings are not common summer birds in my neighborhood. The birds visited the tree about every 90 minutes on average and they rarely stayed for more than a minute. So I had to concentrate intensely in order not to miss such fleeting opportunities. This male was flying upwards from one branch to another, turning his masked head to the side and just showing a glimpse of his yellow tipped tail feathers, which look dipped in paint. The apparent absence of vocal signaling between the birds puzzled me until I pulled up a cedar waxwing sonogram. The high-pitched sound that these birds emit is centered at about 7,000 to 8,000 cycles per second, compared, for example, to the American robin that clocks in at about 4,000 hertz. Even on the recording, these songs were faint to me. Remorsefully, I realized that too many hours in the pilot seat of an airplane and on the end of a chainsaw have destroyed the hair cells in my cochlea, which respond to these high frequencies. So there's a couple of examples of stories in the book. Um, these slides are here to remind me that sometimes something gets in the way when you're trying to photograph a bird and, and some of those things are very nice to photograph in their own right. There is a bird in this photograph actually, there's an owl in the tree, not that you can see it, but this is a water hole in Namibia that I, I took this September and just a, a gorgeous evening with rhinos and, and giraffes. Um, these are southern elephant seals, a male and a female, massive sexual dimorphism. The male is like three times as big as the female. Um, sometimes you get a chance to photograph 
the Milky Way uh, at uh, Bandon, Oregon, for example, where it's a great place to go to photograph tufted puffins. But I want to draw to a close now by um, talking about the decline in birds that is occurring worldwide. I think many of you realize that we are in the middle of a catastrophic extinction event. In the last 50 years, there are, there are 3 billion less birds than there were 50 years ago. Today, there are 3 billion birds less. There are so many birds that are on the threatened spectrum of the uh, IUCN um, classification here. They are either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, that we are losing species at a rapid rate. Some of the birds I've shown you, the striated caracara from the Falklands is near threatened. And there are a maximum of 2,500 of these birds in existence. The Stella sea eagle that I photographed in Japan, there are only 3,800 of these birds and they are decreasing. The astonishingly rare marvelous spatula tail in Peru, there are less than a thousand birds and they, their numbers are decreasing. The Japanese red crowned cranes, less than 2,000 and they are decreasing. The wandering albatross photographed in the Southern Ocean, 21,000 birds decreasing. And so in the epilogue to the book, I spend time discussing this decline and discussing what the photographer can do to help bring awareness to this extinction that is in process. And in the final words in the book, I say, that while we're waiting for the next generation to usher in a more nature-friendly approach, photographers can help accelerate awareness. We travel to places that most people only know from magazines or nature documentaries, and we bring back images that can awaken consciousness. We visit the great reservoirs of avian biomass, the Pantanal in Brazil, the Amazonian regions of Peru that are most threatened by de deforestation and climate-induced wildfires. It's my hope that by capturing and sharing the ethereal beauty of bird flight, I might nudge some readers to take a more combative and evangelical stance on turning back the tide of the sixth extinction. So I'll leave you with where I am today. This photograph is on view in the library. I have a, a new camera that is quite remarkable. It has artificial intelligence, which actually detects the bird's eye in the frame and then tracks it across the field of view. This, another picture from the library exhibition was taken with that camera. Um, this is the typical setup. I use a long lens with that camera on a tripod. And uh, you see here a, a great orchestral uh, taken. And you notice how sharp the eye is. And sometimes I think I look at the result from the camera and I think, boy, that's cheating. So it's been my pleasure to uh, give you a, uh, a brief preview of the book today. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I would be happy to answer some questions. You can follow me at Insta on Instagram at Peter Cavan and Birds, and also the same name on Facebook. And my website is uh, petercavanagh.us. So please visit. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a fascinating, fascinating presentation with some really wonderful photographs. Um, so just so everybody knows how to raise their hand or um, chat question, just hover your mouse over the screen and you'll see a reactions button, which should give you the option to raise your hand or click on the chat bubble. Um, Lorna has a comment that actually is leads to one of the questions I have. Um, Lorna says, absolutely fascinating presentation and exquisite photography. You have the patience of a saint. And I always wonder when I see bird photography and have heard um, bird photographers speak, just how long 
do you actually sit there and wait for things? And how uncomfortable are you? And what do you think about that whole time? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And, and Lorna knows from experience because Lorna exercises along the tumbler and she has, uh, <laughs> she's been out and she's back and I'm still waiting underneath the tree. Um, I wait a long time. Um, I don't believe in disturbing birds. Um, you know, when I think that flying is the most energetic thing they do in the day and that their energy budgets are limited, for some reason, I have the patience to wait. I am not a patient person in generally in my life, but in this part of my life, I am quite content to, to wait. And what do I think about? Well, sometimes I, I think of some tussle between the bird and myself. Uh, the bird doesn't want to fly unless there's a very good food reward at the end of the flight. I want the bird to fly because I want the picture. <laughs> and so uh, I just uh, sort of lull myself into thinking what the bird's thinking. But of course, at the same time, I can't lull myself too much because the picture that I want, I'll miss it if I'm more than one second late. So I stand waiting, looking through, looking at the screen of the camera, waiting for that picture. Hmm. That sounds um, a bit meditative. But it, the other question you asked is how uncomfortable are you? Well, <laughs> the most uncomfortable I have ever been was um, in the Falkland Islands. I had heard that there was one Lucasitic uh, Southern Rock Hopper penguin chick that is, uh, not an albino, but a completely white chick on the outside. And I really wanted a picture of that chick. And so um, I sought it out and found it. And of course, there's this escalating scale of the things you want. Once I got the chick, I wanted the picture of the chick being fed. So I lay in penguin guano for about an hour. And anybody who has been near penguin guano knows it's pretty disgusting. <laughs> And so I lay in penguin guano for an hour and I got my picture. So I was really very happy to go home and shower every part of my clothing off and, uh, uh, and be happy with the picture. <laughs> um, a follow-up, a question from Lorna is, what birds have you dreamed of photographing and not yet captured? Yeah, I was just chatting with Mary at the library about this today. I would like to photograph a birds of paradise in flight. You know, all the pictures we see of Birds of Paradise, they're doing their wonderful mating dances. And I have very rarely seen a picture of Birds of Paradise in flight. So um, I am, I actually know the person who wrote the guide to the birds of New Guinea. Um, those of you um, uh, who, who uh, know the Marine Director for the Friends of the San Juan know that her brother-in-law wrote the guide, the, the authoritative bird guide to, uh, to, to Java and New Guinea, and I've talked to him about it. But, you know, travel is so difficult at the moment. And so uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm gonna be there in the near future or not. Hmm. Wendy Mickle wanted to see if um, you have seen the lilac breasted roller. I have, and mm. um, I've even bought my wife a t-shirt with a lilac breasted roller on. It's an absolutely gorgeous bird, Wendy, I agree with you. I don't have the greatest flight shot of it, but I do have a nice portrait. Mm. Okay, I have some questions that have come in. I can't tell who. I think I just did Wendy's. Um, my computer's acting, oh, okay, from... Jean, I presume, um, complimenting your photos and presentation. Uh, he's heard that photographers sort of lament that they no longer have the joy of watching pictures develop in the dark room. Um, did you start out in the dark room and do you miss that experience? Uh, thanks for the question, Jean. So 
uh, I was never very good in the darkroom. My pictures never really popped the way I would like them. You got to remember, I was like under 10 years old at the time, but nevertheless, I wasn't much of an expert. But I think there is a parallel now in post-processing. Um, typically, I shoot all my pictures raw. And when you look at a raw image compared to a JPEG image, the JPEG image sparkles because the camera automatically applies a color profile to it. So when you process the raw image, you're actually doing the artwork on the picture in post-processing. You are the one that has to bring out the colors of the bird. It's very neutral as a raw image. And so I spend a lot of time post-processing, you know, particularly in Lightroom. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, in favor of, some people go to town, like for example, uh, if you have got a bird that uh, you cut the wing off, some people will go into Photoshop and they'll find another wing and they'll join them together. I, I don't like doing that at all, but I do enjoy uh, the subtleties of post-processing in Lightroom. And uh, that I think is, the equivalent joy to seeing the picture emerge from a dish of uh, developer in the darkroom. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned at the very beginning, you showed us a picture of an owl in flight as one of your earlier photographs. And you said that you wouldn't necessarily be proud of that shot today. Yeah. And I'm curious, to know why, because to me, that was an amazing shot. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so first of all, um, it's very grainy because I didn't have a decent camera at the time. Mm. Uh, the foreground is cluttered and I, I have kind of developed a style as you've seen tonight where I like um, uh, a, a, an uncomplicated background if possible, or if the background's complicated, I want it to say something about the habitat in which the bird lives. Um, so that, that picture did have the habitat, um, but I think it was just that it was, it was a bit grainy and it wasn't tack sharp. And uh, sharpness to photographers is everything, which is why this new camera that I have is just so amazing because you don't just get one sharp image, you get you know 10 or 20 sharp images in every press of the button. Hmm. Okay, Tom has a question. How much do you rely on local guides for birding? I assume like when you go to another country and you're traveling with a guide. Yeah, Tom, 100%. Um, when you just parachute in, then your chances of finding the birds that you want uh, are very low indeed. And so if you have limited time, uh, as most of us do when we visit places, you've got to have somebody who knows uh, the lie of the land. Um, even here on Lopez, as I mentioned, to get that osprey picture, uh, that didn't just happen because I was walking around with the camera. That happened because Beth had said to me, look, I'll tell you the tree that that bird likes to go on. And that's what your local guide will do. So I always, always have a guide. Mm -hmm. I imagine your presentation included all of the, the other wildlife that you encounter and the beauty of the places that you travel. I imagine that you have met some amazing people along the way as well. You know, I really have. And I talk in the book actually about, about one guy. I was at a, a lodge called the Cock of the Rock Lodge. You know, the Cock of the Rock, there's a, uh, there's a picture I have on the wall here of the Cock of the Rock. It's this bizarre bird that has, it seems to have this big ball on its head, red, crimson head. Um, I was at the Cock of the Rock Lodge and I was had my lens under my, to, under my arm. So it was obvious I was a photographer and this guy, came to me and in perfect English, he said, come with me, we'll photograph the best effing bird in the valley. And I said, oh, okay. Um, this guy turned out to be a very famous iconoclastic Peruvian filmmaker. And um, he had just been making a, a film at great risk to his own life about 
the, uh, the destruction of habitat on the new highway that is to join a Trans America Highway that is to join the Pacific and the Atlantic, and it's just been a it's just been a, an avenue for illegal mining, illegal hunting, and he was exposing that. And so, yeah, um, if you are open to talking to people, you really do meet some just fascinating folks. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question from Vita. Hi, Vita. Um, kind of a adjacent to an aerodynamics question, but do no. you know why penguins waddle? <laughs> yeah, because they have really short legs. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I do have some penguins in the book and you'd think, how can I have penguins in a book about flight? Well, it turns out that rockhopper penguins have an aerial phase. Um, they have made life very hard for themselves. First of all, they will only go in the water at a place where there is a rocky cliff. So when they come back, they catch a wave and they either get killed or maimed or they get ashore, one of the two. And then if they get ashore, they have to climb 200 vertical feet hopping to their nest. So this is a bird that makes life very difficult. So I spent the whole of an afternoon um, at the neck on Saunders Island and the Falkland Islands waiting for as many penguins as I could that got some air at the same time after they caught a wave. And so I have a picture in the book of four of them out of the air looking like this as though they're trying to fly. So yeah, penguins are just, I mean, there's, you could watch them all day long. They're just totally fascinating. <laughs> Um, well, we have just some final questions about where people can get your book and then what's next for you. Yeah, so um, I was at the Lopez bookstore today and Karen said that she has um, a few copies in at the moment, which I signed and she's got more coming in next week. So um, the Lopez bookstore is good. Um, it's on all of the you know, places that are unmentionable to a local bookstore owner, um, like Amazon. I didn't say that, um, <laughs> but you can get it on Amazon. Um, what's next? Well, as of now, I should be in Colombia in about one month's time, um, just after Christmas. And um, of course, who knows with travel the way it is. I have been traveling very carefully. Um, in, uh, in, in May, I was in Costa Rica. I was masked the whole time, fortunately, because the day after I got home, I got an email from my guide saying, oh, Peter, by the way, I want you to know I tested positive for COVID. And by the way, I didn't feel very good on the last day together. And I thought, yeah, you know, why'd you go to work? <laughs> um, so that I consider that a narrow escape. Um, I then went to Namibia and um, there it was really good because um, it was prior to Omicron and we ate outside every single meal outside and traveled outside. And I masked up with my guide until five days in until both of us were sure that uh, we were symptom free. Um, so I have taken some risks, I think, but I've been as careful as I can. I'm obviously triple vaxxed and um, always masked. So mm -hmm. yeah, Colombia is the next thing. Now, Colombia is a little different for me because Colombia is full of a lot of pretty birds, little pretty birds. And that's not quite my style, but I am hoping that uh, I will be able to get little pretty birds flying. So we shall see. Yeah, well, there's some amazing hummingbird photographs in this book. So I think yeah. you, you can get them. I know you can, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And thank you so much, Peter, and congratulations. And we look forward to the next one. <laughs> thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Okay, bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.